That says it all. English, because it's English. written in English, but... So, uh, Judith Kalik is a specialist in Eastern European Jewish history, and mainly her uh, She authored two books, two important books, one published in Hebrew, and the second one uh, in Greek, in English, uh, and uh, multiple articles. Uh, her main focus is on Judeo-Christian relations. On the uh, encounter between Jews and Slavs, uh, more broadly, yes, in the so early relations between encounters. So it's Encou uh, relations and encounters. More cautious. More it's cautious. No relations. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just, <laughs> just encounters. All kinds of encounters uh, in relations. Uh, and also so the Jewish social history, I think. Yes. Yes. At least your last book. Yes. So yes. Also yes. Jewish uh, social history. Jew Judith discovered, uh, yeah, Judith discovered and brought to light unknown documents, many important. Jewish history. Oh. And, uh, today she will uh, she will talk she will talk on uh, uh, Christian accountants in the modern Poland as well. Yes. So it's it's it's, it's uh, an attempt to summarize the issues. <coughs> The main points, not to summarize, but main points of this issue. This is really a typical uh, example of my work, this presentation today, because my work focuses mainly on uh, encounters between Jews and Slavs, as I said, in the early modern period. And it could be uh, specified as, um, um, as a combination of uh, Jewish and uh, non-Jewish sources. Especially intensive use of Polish archival material, Polish, Belarusian, Russian, Ukrainian archival materials, and uh, from this point of view, this lecture today is a typical example of my work, and I would will read it with your permission. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was, from its establishment to the dissolution, the host country of the largest Jewish community in the world. The majority population of the Commonwealth consisted mainly of Slavonic peoples. For this reason, the cultural interaction between Jews and Slavs took place in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in the most intensive <coughs> way and continued for the most prolonged <coughs> period. The segregation between Jews and Christians, preached by the Church and supported by the Jewish Halakha, was never implemented in Poland-Lithuania to the extent it was uh, uh, practiced in other countries. Nevertheless, in spite of this promising background, the evidence of cultural interaction between the Jews and Slav Slavs in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth is much less intensive than it might be expected. The reason for this is not the success of the policy of segregation, but the nature of the focal points of this interaction. The problem is that, that the cultural interaction took the most intensive form on lower, illiterate layers of society, and left only indirect evidence. I would like to identify three most important focal points of the Jewish-Christian very close, intimate mutual acquaintances and mutual influence. Christian servants dwelling in Jewish houses, mainly women, cooks, maids, wet nurses and governesses, Jewish rural leaseholders, in tavern and shopkeepers, living in the narrow microcosmos of the village together with the local peasants, and urban Jews converted to Christianity and Christians converted to Judaism for a variety of reasons. Let us, let us examine these points one by one. Jewish employment of Christians as servants was widespread. Reading the ma memoirs of Shol uh, Shlomo Maimon, Dov of Bolehov, or Moses Wasserzug, or looking at any documents dealing with Jewish Christians' economic contacts one cannot escape immediate impression that there was no Jewish business or leasehold that did not have Christian servants connected with it. It is important to stress that not only were Christian servants employed in large numbers by Jews, but that they also worked at all levels of the Jewish society. There was practically no Jewish family, including those in the lower social strata that did not employ Christian servants. The following paragraph of the resolution from the Council of Lithuania is just one of many examples that testify to this, and I quote. It is forbidden for any man whose wealth does not amount to more than four groshe to keep a non-Jewish maid without the knowledge and consent of the heads of the council or heads of the community, 
And this uh, prohibition applies in particular to the recipients of alms, who should not keep any maid at all, end of quote. With, uh, with few exceptions, employment of Christians by Jews as servants only wa was the only way in which it was possible for Christians to obtain close and intimate contacts with Jews, their way of life, language, religion, <coughs> and culture. It allowed for interpersonal exchange and even personal sympathy well beyond business relations. It is clear that such contacts with Christian servants also made it possible for Jews to make better acquaintances with Christians and, to, uh, and the nuances of their culture, though on a limited scale, since these Christians were dis uh, disconnected from their natural background and lifestyle. Numerous references to Christian servants employed by Jews are found not only in secular Jewish and Polish sources, but also in ecclesiastical sources, burgers literature, resolutions of the Diet, same, and royal orders. The reason for the intensive preoccupation of ecclesiastical sources and of polemical urban literature with the question of Christian uh, in service with the Jews is first of all connected to prohibitions on this practice issued uh, rapidly, uh, repeatedly excuse me, by Polish church synods from, 16, uh, from 1267 onwards. As part of general church policy intended to segregate Jews from Christians as much as possible. Christians were prohibited from being employed as servants by Jews. The church doctrine, doctrine that Jews should always be subordinate to Christians served as the religious justification for this segregation. However, it became less and less practical for the church to enforce this doctrine of segregation in Poland, where the Jewish involvement in a variety of economic activities increased steadily with the passing centuries. Some clerics showed understanding for the needs of the Jews or simply gave in to the situation. Thus, Bishop of Poznan, Tadeusz Czartoryski, in his pastoral epistle of 1739, published in Warsaw, wrote, and I quote, in those places where these people, the Jews, dwelt, uh, Poles should take care uh, the Jews do not share houses with Christians, and in particular that they do not dance, celebrate festivals, or bath with them. It is forbidden for Jews to keep Christian maids. We permit them, however, to employ people in breweries and in inns for help, for the convenience of the guests. They are permitted to keep a man or a woman not less than 50 years old, end of quote. This acceptance of, of uh, practical needs was displayed also by Jewish councils, which usually adopted church prohibitions. Thus, in the record book of the Council of Lithuania, we find the following resolution from the year 1628, and I quote, and this regulation is not at all applicable for keeper of leaseholds, who need many servants because of their multiply uh, occupations, they are allowed to keep as many non-Jewish maids as their job demands, but not more than this, end of quote. It is clear from this source, as well from others, that non-Jewish non servants were necessary for the Jews and were uh, numerous for just that reason. Non-Jewish servants were chiefly necessary, of course, for the obser observance of Jewish holidays and especially of the Shabbat, the so-called Goim Shel Shabbat. Christian servants employed by the Jews can be subdivided, except this uh, group in the breweries and business and so on, subdivided into two groups according to their employment pattern. The first group includes servants employed by the Jewish community, and the second group uh, consisted mainly of uh, female employed in Jewish households, wet nurses, governesses, maids, and cooks. The first group of servants was engaged in a variety of occupations such as extinguishing candle in synagogues on Shabbat and other holidays, guarding Jewish cemeteries, performing an Haman in Purim Spiel, and so on. Bishop Lipsky wrote in his pastoral epistle of 1737, and I quote, it is forbidden for Jews to take Christians to extinguish candles on their day of judgment, Yom Kippur, of course, or when they celebrate the festival in honor of a man, sick. Catholics should not perform these duties under penalty of a uh, thousand grivna fine, and those Catholics who agree to perform these roles should be arrested." End of quote. Similar prohibitions against Christians playing Haman and Purim, extinguishing candles in synagogues during Jewish holidays, and guarding Jewish cemeteries are, are also found 
in resolutions of Synod of Łódzk in 1726 and other sources. Christians were hired also as undertakers, as we know from prohibition pastoral epistles and resolutions of synods. Resolutions to this effect from different regions confirm that these kinds of activities were widespread and not isolated cases. The second group of Christian servants worked within households. From the point of view of intercultural contact, these household servants, of course, were the most important. They were usually f uh, female, cooks, wet nurses, and governesses. These servants are especially interesting since they were engaged in a close contact with the Jewish family in its lifestyle. Furthermore, some of them, especially those who cared for children, not only learned about the Jewish way of life, they also possibly influenced it. We have evidence that the Polish and Ruthenian languages were often learned from such servants. For instance, in the families of Shlomo Maimon and Dov Berov Bolkov. These servants often had lodgings in one room with the family, which was only a heated room in the house. They also often ate uh, with the family, as Basartuk testifies, describing his father's house in his memoirs from the 18th century. And I quote, the custom was that nobody ate any of the regular meals until all servants and maids were seated around the table and he himself, Moses' father, was eating together with them bread and anything the Lord gave them." End of Some Jews probably employed non-Jewish teachers to instruct their children in their, in their languages, uh, since it is hardly conceivable that the father of Dovov Bolehov was the sole exception in the 18th century. Dovov Bolehov writes, and I quote, and then I studied writing and speaking in Polish, as my late father had wished to which end he had kept in his house and in circumcised Paul, who could teach me to write and speak with excellence. I studied these subjects for a little while, along with Latin, of which I understood most of the grammar and vocabulary. But uh, some of the members of our community began to gossip and to doubt my fate, saying that I studied this, God forbid, not for the sake of heaven, and I was forced to stop my studies." End of quote. On the other hand, many Christian servants learned Yiddish. Franciszek Antoni Kobielski wrote in his sermon, address to, uh, sermon addresses to the Jews, and I quote, some Christians go so far that Christian women who serve you begin to speak with your children in Jewish language, forgetting that you are exiles in our state, end of quote. These servants learned the Jewish way of life not only by observation, but also through active participation. In the resolutions of the Council of Four Lands for the year 1607, we, found, we, we find, and I quote, women should be careful to soak and salt meat themselves or to have an Israeli maid to do it, but their non-Jewish maids should not do it at all. But also in cooking food, they should take care since they often cause their husbands to sin by putting forbidden things into it and, mix di and mixing diary utensils with meat ones or vice versa. And here also known Jews are involved in cooking. They also should not give a maid a diary candle, since she is not careful to avoid dripping drops into utensils. Therefore, anyone who fears God should be sure to give his non-Jewish maid a wax candle when she washes diary utensils." And of course, <coughs> It is clear from this evidence that, we, that uh, the work of non-Jews in the kitchens of Polish Jews was widespread. Otherwise, there would have been no need to issue such regulations, and that it was necessary to explain to non-Jewish servants the rules of kashrut and other Jewish religious rules. Nonetheless, the church continued to struggle against the Jewish employment of Christian servants, particularly wet nurses and governesses, since, <coughs> unlike other servants, these were women lodged in Jewish houses. The church restrictions on the use of Christian wet nurses and governesses is, particular, uh, is, uh, pract uh, is particular, probably grew, uh, sorry, I don't understand what I write here, probably grew out of the ruling in the Shulchan Aruch that a Jewish mother is forbidden to give her baby to a star worshiper for breastfeeding in her own house, but that non-Jewish wet nurses may feed the baby in the mother's house. Consequently, it was widely held, especially among urban workers, that Christian wet nurses and governesses lodging in Jewish houses were not only treated, treated as subordinates, but were also particularly, uh, 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 also particularly at risk because Jews, lustful by nature, might seduce them. 
burghers associated Jews with the devil. Those qualities were also expressed, whose qualities, excuse me, were also expressed in lust, thus promoting the image of a sexually unrestrained, lustful Jew. Sebastian Petrizzi, a professor of the Krakow Academy and a prominent personality of burger origin, for example, claimed in an early 17th century essay that the Jew, <coughs> excuse me, that the Jews, and I quote, lead girls towards sin and immoral behavior and seduced married women, end of quote. And the famous Jesuit preacher Piotr Skarga wrote in his book, Lives of Saints, that the Jews, and I quote, lead astray, uh, lead astray young Christian maidens who serve them towards sin, end of quote. The most outspoken was Matthäus Bambus, a Jesuit man who claimed in the early 17th century that the Jews were regularly involved in sexual relations with their Christian maids whom they impregnated, seduced to sell, sell the holy host and even to hand, uh, hand over Christian children for ritual slaughter to the Jews. As a matter of fact, sex between Jews, uh, Jewish employers and their Christian maids was not uncommon. In Helm, for example, a Christian maid named Marusha complained to the court of law on September 29, 1515, that her Jewish employer, Dr. Yuda, had raped her and that she had given birth to a baby as a result. She demanded compensation and financial support for her, for her and the baby. The next day, Vasily Basil Baka, the Bishop of Helm, supported her claim, testifying, in, testifying that Marusha had confessed before the baptism of her child to the father Sylvester and her godmother that Judah, the chief rabbi of Helm, was the, child, uh, was the child's father. However, no claim of rape was mentioned at this occasion. It is possible that the rape was introduced before the court in order to force the defendant to recognize his fatherhood and to accept a financial settlement. <coughs> we learn of a similar case in Lutsk in 1659. Katarina Teslianka, together with the Orthodox spiritual supervisor, Duhovny Uryad of Lutsk, complained about her Jewish employer, Abrashko, on November 10, 1659. She not only claimed that, the uh, that uh, he employed her as a uh, maidservant in violation of ecclesiastical and secular laws, but also that he did not pay her annual salary and tried to seduce her, and when he did not succeed, raped her. According to the maid, Abrashko convinced her to, save, to serve him for another year. However, Katarina managed to flee to the Orthodox spiritual supervisor who helped her flee, uh, uh, file a complaint with the court. The court decided to uh, release Abrashko on the bail of 10,000 copy of Lithuanian grosses from the Jewish community of Woods. Although, although an actual rape cannot be excluded, one can guess that, as in previous examples, the rape case was possibly introduced in order to extract the unpaid salary from the employer since the final settlement amounted to financial compensation. <coughs> Relations of genuine friendship and uh, uh, fidelity could also develop between masters and servants. Dovov Bolehov wrote in his memoirs that when his house was attacked by robbers in the November 1759, he fled with his wife to the river, leaving behind only one non-Jewish maid from Skau, who took by herself all movables which she could, that, which she could that were not damaged by the fire, including books, about 100 in number, mostly by ancient writers. And I quote, this maid saved them, saying, my master loves books, and I should save them by putting them into the bag. She returned for them twice to be sure she had saved everything, end of quote. Let us proceed to our second focal point of the Jewish-Slavonic interaction, the rural Jews. Although Jews are typically viewed as urban dwellers, there was considerable rural Jewish population in early modern Eastern Europe. The, uh, <coughs> the census of Jews in the Polish crown lands conducted in 1764-65 indicate that of the total, total number of Jews in the region, about one third lived in rural settlements. The main reason for this ruralization of the Jewish population was the transition of the Jews to the lease holding as their main occupation at the beginning of the early modern age. 
The most widespread form of leasehold was, as in the Polish-Lithuanian economy in general, the leaseholding of propinacja right. It's the right to produce and sell alcohol. Propination rapidly exp uh, expanded and reached its peak in the 17th and 18th centuries, being the uh, easiest way of marketing grape locally in the form of alcohol. <coughs> Contrary to the stereotypic view of the Jewish rural leaseholder, uh, uh, excuse me, the Jewish rural leaseholders were not lonely Jews iso isolated from their brethren. The Jewish population of many villages was often quite considerable, since several leaseholders, shop, inn, and tavern keepers with their families were present there. Rural Jews of some villages formed rural Jewish communities, which sometimes tried to gain independence from any urban Jewish community. Relations of uh, rural Jews, uh, Jewish leaseholders, with the uh, local Slavonic peasants were rather complicated. On the one hand, the Jewish leaseholder was an important figure in the village, and uh, the rural inn served as a focal point of social life, providing often the only place different social strata could interact. The inn often served also as a shop, and both inn and shopkeepers usually also lent money to peasants against the pledge. On the other hand, the Jewish leaseholder was seen in the eyes of peasants as a, as a representative, often the sole one, of their lord. The leaseholding contracts usually included a clause which provided the leaseholder with the curve labor of local serfs. serfs. The Jewish rule over Christian serfs Serfs was problematic for the, Jewish uh, for the Jews themselves from halachic reasons, not less than to the church. The problem was that if an entire village owner or an estate was leased to the Jew, all its inhabitants could not either work on Sabbath or bread pigs and so on, since, since the enterprise was under the so-called name of Israel. The compulsory work of servants was especially problematic since it differed from the normal employment of the so-called Shabbat Goy, for whom the halachic solution was already found. However, economic needs caused a constant violation of the halachic rules, just as of the ecclesiastical legislation. The halachic solution was urgently needed, and indeed it was soon found. Rabbi Yoel Sirkis Habach ruled that, the, that uh, the leasehold is not a Jewish enterprise since the Jewish leaseholder serves as a Tsar minister and therefore is permitted for the, uh, uh, permitted for the Gentiles to work on Sabbath and Jewish <coughs> Excuse me, holidays. But after a judicial inquiry, he admitted that he made a heavy blow on the mouth of Yakub Michalik. The court sentenced Michalik to pay two grzywne to the Jew, but the later had to pay three grzywne to the court and to apologize to Michalik. In 1764, Maya Vidrak, a miller in the ecclesiastical village of Vengluf, used to sell to the Jewish innkeeper various Im uh, implements of his mill, such as bolts, railing, etc., bringing the mill to a standstill. The community asked the econo manager of the village to replace the drunkard with another miller. The latter, however, swore on a cross in 1765 that he will never again enter the Jewish inn, and only his wife will be allowed to bring him some vodka as a remedy in case of his severe illness. <coughs> Priest, monks, and other cler uh, clerics uh, mm, were often found among the regular customers of Jewish taverns and inns, and their drinking habits sometimes caused trouble. Thus, for instance, Jakub Zawuski, a provost of Wajimish, complained on January 20, 1621, to the judge of the Jews, de uh, to the Jews deputy voyevoda, that when he left his parish for businesses, he appointed one of the priests as temporary caretaker for all church property. The latter used to drink ext extensively at the inn of the Jew called Benyash and even left in his hands a book of church records as a pledge for his death. The Jew sold the book to someone else, and now the provost demanded its return. Another example is found in the memoirs of Shlomo Maimon, who wrote that the Orthodox priest, and I quote, spent most of his time at the inn where he drank spirits with his parishioners, the peasants, 
and always let his liquor be put down to his, to his account without any intention of paying, end of quote. In, the, uh, excuse me. in order to evade his debt, the wicked priest initiated a blood libel which eventually led to Solomon's grandfather losing his leasehold. In an attempt to avoid necessary tension, unnecessary tensions, Rabbi Yehuda, Yehuda Pochowitzer wrote in mid-17th century Lithuania in his book Vod Chachamim, Honor of Wise Men, that the Jewish innkeepers should serve their cleric customers on Shabbat for the sake of ways of peace, Mitnei Darkei Shalom. Jews themselves were often not different from their Slavic neighbors on their drinking, drinking habits, as Shlomo Maimon testifies in his memoirs, and I quote, and wherever they, Jewish general leaseholders, found the leaseholder who, instead of looking after his own interest and those of his landlord in the improvement of his leasehold by in the industry and economy, spent the whole day in idleness or lay drunk about the stove, they soon brought him to the, uh, his senses and rose him out of his idleness by a flogging. This procedure, of course, acquired for the general leaseholders among their own people the name of tyrants, and of course. The positive side of the rural Jewish experience also should not be overlooked. The rural inn or tavern was the place where Jews and Slavs often met in situations as the diverse as violence and hostility on the one hand, and friendship and cooperation on the other. Close contacts and mutual life experience led to better acquaintances between Jews and Christians and even to mutual cultural influences. Rural Jews shared often with their Slavic co-villagers common beliefs and uh, superstitions. Thus, this is especially for you, Yohanan, wake up. Thus, Piotr Chekhovsky wrote in 1624 that many Christian pregnant women go to some Jewish witches in order to obtain from them some magic amulets and hang them, uh, hang them on their uh, throats. The author admits, however, that, and I quote, this way one Jewess, a Jewess from Mechov, cured one old man from fever, end of quote. This is, I, incidentally, the only reference to Jewish female witches. Slavic witches are, of course, well known, and some Jews also uh, were among their customers. Thus, Rabbi Meir Margaliot of Yazowitz wrote in his responses, uh, Meir Netivim from 1777-1782, that in se uh, several cases of Agunot, the Jewish women obtained the information about their husbands that from the Gentile female astrologers. And I quote, has she talked to a babke, who is an old goya who looked at stars? Or another quote. I have asked a young Goya, do you know how to look at stars? And so on. Rural Jews usually knew local Slavonic languages, as some of them even did not know Yiddish, as Solomon Maimon writes, and I quote, a Jew who was named after his village Svezhen and was known as the biggest scandal in the whole neighborhood, offered him, general, general leaseholder, a hand. This fellow was so ignorant that did not even understand the Jewish language and made use, therefore, of Russian, end of quote. The third focal point of interaction of our discussion can be bluntly labeled as sex, or love, if you wish. Contrary to the literary stereotypes that were uh, preoccupied with the nobility, the real Jewish-Christian mixed marriages and love affairs usually occurred in the burghers and servants' milieus, where, uh, where everyday contact between Jews and Christians were most intense. Paradoxically, precisely these two groups of the Christian population were traditionally the main supporters of anti-Jewish views. However, the practical opportunities for men and women uh, from both communities to meet were most frequent inside the same social milieu. It would <coughs> therefore seem that social boundaries were stronger obstacles to love than were religious taboos. Symbolically, the sexual union of members of different ethnic and religious groups provided an ideal paradigm for their complete fusion at all levels, but simultaneously expressed their most powerful fears. 
the most, the most explicit uh, prohibition of sexual relations between Jews and Christians is found in the resolutions of the six, uh, 1765 Synod of Lvov, which demanded the imposition of the death penalty for Christians involved in sexual intercourse with Jews in contradiction to civil law as the resolution itself acknowledged. It is interesting that the death penalty is demanded only for Christians whereas the Jews involved in the same offense were only required to pay a fine of 10 marks. An examination of the real cases of such unions shows this, uh, that the reality of common life in a, uh, in a multi-religious and multi-ethnic society was more powerful than any cultural symbolism. The common life, however, was severely restricted by social barriers with their own symbolism and stereotypes. Rabbi Hillel of Vilna describes a case that occurred in the second half of the 17th century when a Christian man wanted to marry a Jewish woman. When she refused, he claimed before the town's owner that she had sworn that she was going to convert. An uncle of the girl, who feared that she would be uh, arrested, smuggled her uh, to another town. The town's owner decided to arrest all the Jewish elders and the rabbi of his town as hostages till the girl turned herself into the court. We find several similar stories told from Christian perspective. On August 21, 1669, the Greek union priest of Bzezh filed a complaint against the Jewish communities of Kobrin and Bzezh. They accused them of having uh, uh, enticed a woman to reconvert to Judaism. A certain Podorowski, burger of Kobrin, had married the woman, Judith, who was the daughter of Shmuelo, a former Jewish leaseholder from Verge. Judith had been baptized under the name of Anastasia. However, according to Podorowski's claim, her father and other Jews convinced her to flee her husband and in doing so abandoning her son, but taking with her money, silver, dresses, linen, and other property amounting to 2,000 zlotys. Podorowski asked for assistance to retrieve his wife, whose location was unknown, and to compensate him for the loss of his property. Their marriage, in, in the end, was dissolved. The Jews were less successful in another case, as the lover behaved in the best tradition of Polish chivalry. In 1758, in Krakow, a Jewish girl, Rachel Abelesova, who had already maintained an affair with the Christian by the name of Pachorkevich, for some time, decided to convert. In an attempt to prevent this from happening, the Jews arrested her. Her lover assembled several brave men under the command of Yusuf Kazimierski, who jumped over the wall of the Jewish town of Kazimierz at midnight of February 17, 1758, released the girl, and smuggled her into Krakow. There she was baptized under the name of Tekla and married Pachorkevich. The Jewish communal elders filed a complaint in the Supreme Co uh, Council of the Krakow Municipality in 1759, which remained without any effect. A Kozak also could be quite an attractive mate for a Jewish girl. Thus, in 1697, Leibovich, himself Jewish, complained in a court that his Jewish maid Genia fled with Daniel, a Kozak colonel, taking with her some of her master's money and other property. Nathan Gelber has, uh, Gelber has claimed that only Jewish women were ready to convert to Christianity, to Christian faith for reasons of love. However, some Jewish men also converted in order to be able to marry Catholic women. One Jewish convert married to a Catholic woman, woman is mentioned in the Council Minutes in class of the coaching, where we find a, sale con a sales contract for a house bought by Jews from a Christian woman. Her son-in-law was a Jewish convert who presu presumably had converted before the marriage with her daughter. Christian women were also quite able to find Jewish men attractive. On December 7, 1548, the Bishop of Vilna complained to King Zygmunt Abus that many women of his, of his diocese had left their husbands to be with Jews, Turks, and Tatars, and that their children were educated in the faith of their lovers. This demonstrates the obvious observation that the fear of the Jews was not unique, but instead reflected the general xenophobic fear of members of a group being attracted to outsiders. In addition to the uh, prospect of conversion, 
Jewish communities and councils feared the financial burden connected with their obligation to ransom the Jews accused in unlawful affairs with Christian women. Thus, mayor of Lubin was asked the following halachic question, and I quote, I was asked in, uh, in the matter of a youth captured by the star worshippers Christians, who claimed that he was captured with the star worship corps, and they wanted to try him to death or to force him to convert, God forbid. Does the community <coughs> have to ransom him according to the, commandments of ca uh, to the commandment of captives ransom, Pidion Shruim, or should he be treated as an apostate with regard to one particular commandment, Mumar le Dvara Vera for whom this is no obligation, there is no obligation of ransom, even if it's for uh, his own appetite, let the avon. And furthermore, he committed his crime by throwing himself into capital danger because of his carnal lust. Shall we pay ransom for him even beyond his price? And what is his price? End of quote. Let us proceed with an exceptionally tragic story of true love overcoming national and religious boundaries even under the threat of death. On October 21, 1748, Mikhail Kroil filed a complaint with the court of Mohilev accusing Abraham Mikhailovich and Paraska Danilovna of unlawful union. On November 8, 1748, uh, the defendants made the following statements which deserve to be quoted in full then, and I do so. My name is Abraham Mikhailovich. I was born in Płotsk, where, where I had a wife named Gisha and Kelevna from Diesna, who I left a day after our wedding because of her insanity. I then came to Dobravka, to the estate of Mr. Mison, where I was hired by his leaseholder, Leib, as a sub-leaseholder. There I met a maid, Paraska, and in 1733, we began to live together and lived for a year and a half until she became pregnant. We left, Dubra we left Dubravka and she gave birth to a girl in a, na uh, in a nearby field who died after an hour. We buried her in the field and went to Ushachi and from Ushachi to Komienne and from there to, Chash uh, to Chashniki. On the way, when we went through the villages, she did not speak with anyone, uh, with anyone pretending to be mute. It's just in, as in Bashevis' Zinger uh, <laughs> slave. Thus we came to the estate of Mr. Croyer at Van Doroz, where Paraska accepted our Jewish faith with the help of the Jew Hershko and his wife, who taught her Jewish prayers and the observance of the Sabbath. This Hershko and his wife, Mr. Croyer, leaseholders in Von Van Doroz, and, uh, and since then Paraska had observed the Jewish holidays and went to the synagogue at Knezhitze. I, must, I myself had originally uh, promised to become a Catholic, but later I left the decision to her, whether to remain in her faith or to accept the Jewish one. Afterwards, we began to teach her the Jewish prayers, and we promised each other not to abandon one another, but we were not married, end of quote. Paraska testified next as follows, and I quote, I am of Russian faith, but not pious, being a union. I served Leib, Mr. Mison's leaseholder, in Dubravka for three years and remained a virgin until the Jew Abraham came to the village and remained there as a brewer. When I became pregnant by him, we left Dubravka and I gave birth in a field. Initially, I thought that the girl was dead, but then we saw that she was alive, but we threw her into the grave and left. We walked about a mile and then we stopped in the forest where Abraham ordered me to keep silent and to pretend to be mute. When we came to Vendorosh, he remained there as a brewer for the Jew Hersh, the leaseholder of Mr. Croyer, and uh, there he converted me to Jewish faith, saying that no one will take me in our faith. He told me not to praise our God and not cross myself, but to praise the Jewish God, end of quote. The court of Mahila found both defendants guilty and condemned Abraham as a main, uh, main uh, proprietor to be burned alive in the usual place for such things on the Vilna Highway. Paraska Danilovna was condemned to be beheaded. This dry judicial account reveals an incredible story of human suffering and death of two simple people who literally lost their lives for the sake of love. Several important points deserve special attention in this story. First, both protagonists came from the same social milieu of servants. 
Abraham's first and lucky marriage was arranged in a traditional way through a neg negotiator, Shadchan. The choice of fate was decided mainly for reasons of livelihood. A married male Jew could easily find a job as a brewer, but a married Christian woman could hardly be hired as a maid. Third, the couple remained unmarried since the formal conversion into Judaism the Yur was never completed, either for the fear of persecution within the Jewish community or simply for lack of time. In any case, the Jewish community was aware, aware of the situation as it accepted Paraska into the synagogue. Fifth, the court, uh, has, uh, the court's severe verdict far surpassed the requirements of the law quoted by the perse persecution. Though uh, uh, leaving a baby to die seems shocking to us today, this was most common practice in the early modern age, and such cases usually ended in public flagellation. Conversion to Judaism, to Judaism sorry, I'm tired already, reading. <coughs> Conversion to Judaism, a capital offense under a Magdeburg law, meant uh, decapitation, not burning, and besides, a formal conver conversion never took place. A similar case occurred in Dubno in 1716. Marina Wojciechowna, a Christian girl, converted to Judaism and was arrested together with her Jewish bridegroom, Froim Yakubovich, during their wedding. In this case, the bride was also beheaded, whereas her bridegroom and four other Jews involved in the case were only co uh, condemned to a hundred lashes and expelled from town. Jewish Christian marriages did not necessarily had to uh, lead to the conversion of one of the partners. However, such liberal unions were able to exist only at the margins of both societies. A Jewish woman, Manushka Chaita Rubinova, for example, lived with the Pope Vladislav Vukashovich in Vitebsk in 1719, both of whom were professional thieves in the gang of Martin Chodika. To sum up, there is a gap between the stereotypic image of the closely associated Jew and the magnet, arguing rabbi and the priest, King Kazimierz and his Jewish mistress Esterka, and so on, on the one hand, and the re uh, reality sur uh, surfaced out of documentary evidence. In practice, the Jewish leaseholder hardly ever seen face to face his noble lord, but usually dealt with his general manager, and in a, even uh, these contacts were restricted to matters of everyday businesses. Preaching, to Catholic, uh, preaching of Catholic priests in synagogues was uh, forced upon Jews and was seen by them as gzera, arbitrary punishment, not as an occasion for discussion. Esther's story is, of course, just a legend pretending to explain privileges granted by this king to the Polish Jews. Real-life jewish Slavonic contacts, as we have seen, were conducted on a much lower level of society. Their cultural impact should not be either exaggerated nor neglected, but it should be understood in its proper context. Thank you. Discussion in Russian, discussion in English, what languages are in English? Parts of it were published about servants and right. etc., but uh, the whole, the, it's a new view of the problem. So the material itself, parts of it I have published before. I have a short question. Uh, just about the detail, the, the guarding of cemeteries. Why, why, was it, uh, why did they need non-Jewish persons to, to guard it, and why was it prohibited? It was prohibited because the church didn't want. It's it was prohibited because the church didn't want uh, Christian servants to serve Jews at all, as I have pointed out. But it was necessary, not as Shabbos going, of course, but it was necessary to guard the Jewish cemeteries. You know, uh, when I want to park my car near the Damascus Gate, one Arab came to me and said to me, uh, I will protect your car for 10 shekels. From who will he protect it? From himself. You know, so <laughs> it's much <laughs> the same logic. It's so better it's to have a goy. Yes, a goy, of course, than a Jew. How can a Jew, you know... And we have it in the sources. Yes. Well, we have it in the, the sources, sources, by the way. Sources, we have yes. cases from 18th century Vilnius or Vilnius. Yeah, many, Seventy. many cases. Yeah. I just... Uh, it's better know. to have someone who is not a Jew. Uh, well, uh, I, I think it's a wonderful presentation, but I have many questions, mainly because of the fact that, you know, that many years ago I worked on the same topic, but in the 19th century, yeah. and, but much of it uh, actually goes back to the early modern period. But uh, I, I have 
three major questions. Uh, one of them um, relates to your uh, special field of relation between the church and the Jews uh, in Polish, Ukrainian Commonwealth. Um, all of those things that you mentioned concerning the uh, reg regulations of the church, concerning um, uh, you know, uh, non-Jews working in Jewish household and things like that, are not uh, specific to Poland. They go back to uh, yes, you know where, or even to the uh, you know Visigothic period in Spain in the seventh century. Of course. So could you be uh, more specific on you know what is special in this case, and is there anything? And I'm talking about Catholicism. This is one question. The second question uh, pertains to other kinds of uh, relations that might have had an impact on Jewish-Slavonic relations that you uh, um, selected or preferred not to talk about. Um, one of them uh, has to do with the fascination of uh, Jews in general with the nobility culture. And this is something which uh, is outstanding. And I can give you many examples, uh, and you know it for sure. But could you say some things about the uh, impact of nobility, of Polish nobility culture, or, or, or so-called high culture, uh, if any, on Jewish um, daily life? I'm not talking about religion or, or, or uh, you know, philosophy or, or things like that. But you know, uh, furniture, you know, uh, utensils, things like that. Mm -hmm. And third thing is a, is a comment related to a study them. I study I'm now doing on uh, Jeremy Bentham's presence in um, Belarus in the second half of the 18th century. And we have there um, many depictions of uh, Polish Jewish and like, other Slav Slavonic Jewish relations. Uh, and one of them uh, actually presents the fact that it's not only uh, the close contact between lower classes and um, of both uh, groups of, of this specific, uh, those certain groups. Rather, it pertains also to Polish nobility. One of the very interesting things he, he described is how he stayed in Jewish inns and the landlords, and even sometimes couples, you know, and men and women, Polish lachta, were sleeping there in the same room with the peasant, with the Jews. And uh, it's, uh, he was very uh, surprised to learn that actually, uh, although there was, uh, you know, this uh, class gap, the presence of Polish nobility in those places with the Jews was uh, outstanding. Yes. So we I, have I don't think it goes well with your my impact. Mom, on. When the well, okay. By the way, mind you that the depictions of uh, uh, Bentham and Maimon are from the same area, and uh, even on one of them is from yes. Swutsk. Yes. So as, as simple as that. Yes. yes okay. Yes, of course. But, uh, well, I begin from the, from the end, but uh, as my bond describes, it, uh, this is the fascination of man, that uh, fascination or also critique of, of uh, magnet culture and behavior and so on, magnets is sleeping in inns, but real contact, it, was, uh, it wasn't a uh, real influence, uh, human contact, you know, you can see it in my mom's memoirs. That there is a gap. And my question is, how do we know? From the description, you see. No, you because see the, the sources the you selected are legal sources that uh, no, give you only no specific means. information. However, the things I'm looking for, which I get from 19th century literature, the, there is much to talk about. For, for example, uh, Polish gentry and Jews. They have all kinds of, uh, even cultural contacts that are not in the, that kind of sources. No, but I also quoted my mom, not only with the, uh, with the text, but other texts also, yes. Uh, my impression was that uh, this wasn't, the, the gap was too wide, uh, they were too much apart. You can, uh, this is the impression of my reading of my mom, you see that he sees the magnet, he criticizes him, but it's something very far away, although he, were, in, he, he even describes it, that this magnet, big magnet, Rigido, is sleeping in this dirty inn, with us, and so you see that this, you see, you see that this. Okay, but they slept there all the time, something. and they were yes, well, in, in the same room, of course. even on the same bench. In, in one case, in that time. Of course. Uh, that? Uh, you see, uh, I don't want to say that there were no other uh, points of contact between Jews and Slavs and Jews and Poles, and uh, only this in the lower strata of society. 
And uh, of course, we know that there were contacts between uh, magnates and Jews, but uh, these contacts were mainly less uh, human acquaintances, less emotional, uh, less knowledge about each other, uh, more uh, distance one from uh, from one another, more on a business. Uh, uh, and what about the daughter of the innkeeper who runs away with the nobleman? This is also a case that we have. Of from the well, we have case. Of course, it's history. It's not mathematics. Of course, you know we can find uh, cases of uh, such relations. I don't deny it. I don't say that this is the only form of relations. But this was much more massive. This was a massive form of everyday context of masses of population, not Shtadlanim, for example, who were, uh, you know, uh, who kind of came to the magnet houses and so on, not uh, special Jews, you know, uh, but masses of population. That you can't say about the Polish Lachta in general, and maybe if you can say it about the Polish Lachta, you can't say it about the Polish magnet. This image of the Paritzva Yudi, you know, that you wrote about, it's more, uh, to my mind, it seems to me it's more of a theory, a, a, a practice. So you know, uh, yes, so uh, you see, of course, your influence. Well, I, I was expecting to be asked that question because, uh, well, we know that the Jewish Council of Four Lands said that the mother of the same, for example. Yes, everyday contact, everyday cultural influence. They sat exactly in the manner of the Polish same. Or we know, of course, about Jewish uh, dresses that were uh, under the influence of uh, mag. Well, I'm not sure it's true. They always say that, that the dress of the Jews in the 18th century uh, is um, uh, the dress of magnets, but it's untrue, I think. It's maybe it's copying the lower shlachta more than magnets. Gently. Yes, uh, more the gentry, not the shlachta. And even so, it's part of a general. Um, Townsman culture. It's part of a more general phenomenon of what we call cultural degradation. We know this phenomenon. You know, it's like in, when you see, see um, English uh, films of the 19th century, BBC series, you know, Pride and Prejudice or something, you see this nobleman, their lords uh, in the fashion, dressed in the fashion of the 19th century, and their servants, they are dressed like the noblemen were dressed, but in the 18th century, right? So here you have the same phenomenon. It's not direct influence. In the general degradation of fashion, going into town, and then Jews were part of this general acceptance of, of uh, the degradation of culture. It's more complicated than we is usually see. But as I have said, of course, I don't, you know, I wrote myself about other contexts. I'm not denying that there were other contexts. I just wanted to stress the fact that most of the contexts are the contexts we rarely talk about, they see them, they're not in these layers of society, because of course, in stereotypic view in literature, it is a beneficiary for both parts, but especially for the Jews, to put the Jews against the magnet, against the Paris, not against the Goetia maid, or against, you see, you see the, the contradiction is, have to be, but in reality... By the way, for sure, not in the halakhic literature. Uh, no. I, I disagree with you. In the halakhic literature, most of the discussion of Jewish and Jewish relations is going to go to the lower strata of society, not to the... Of course, society. because this reflects reality. So halakhic it's not that we don't talk about it, that's what we want to say. Because halakhic... Re yes, we talk about it much. Yes, of course, but halakhic... Yeah, yes, but uh, it wasn't research from that point of view, but very <coughs> little research from that point of view, and halakhic literature reflects reality, so you can... You know, he annotated what we call in Hebrew, yes? But when you come to reality, you see this reality <coughs> in halakhic literature. The reality is the context between lower status of society and not uh, magnets and so on. Um, and about your question, the prohibitions, the church prohibitions, of course it's a general trend. It's not Poland. It wasn't invented in Poland. But uh, um, the emphasis on it in, uh, in the legislation of the Polish uh, church legislation is much more uh, evident. You see that there is, uh, this is a question that the church was really preoccupied with in Poland. Why? Because the situation was that, because there were many Gentiles working in Jewish households and so on and so on. So you can see that they, it's not only you see because you have the synodal legislation and then you have the death letter and the legislation that you see the church making efforts to, to somehow uh, to implement it. And you see it in the legislation about servants, because there are also 
church pressed on uh, lay uh, saints and Miki, lay institution to also legislate, uh, uh, give legislation against this practice. And uh, they pressure Jewish communities. We see it in the Jewish takanot, uh, you know, legislation and so on. So it, I would say it's the proportion of it, and uh, that you can see from there the Polish reality, the reality that this is, was a uh, place of the dwelling of the majority of the Jewish people, that many servants were, were involved, different servants, and so on. And this is the, the difference, I think. I have two general questions. Uh, somehow derived also from a discussion. I thank you very much for your presentation, very interesting, impressive. Uh, the first question is, how do you define your corpus of sources? Do you cover everything you can, or do you somehow restrict your, your evidence? And the second one, when you speak about cases and try to prove things, uh, like trends and phenomena for these cases, how do you discern between uh, exceptional and typical? Which also, I think, is... Yeah. Uh, probably there are no good answers for this question. A good question. <laughs> yeah, but also we have to try at least to hope to define how do we deal with this uh, this major issues. Probably you're going to address to this in the written form of the presentation, you have enough time to deal with this now. But I think without that we can't really assess uh, uh, to what extent your results are convincing. Mm -hmm. And uh, your first question, sorry. Corpus? Ah, the, the, the sources. The typical sources. Yes, yes. I try to, all my work is uh, characterized by, at least I try to uh, make use of very different sources, uh, Jewish and non-Jewish sources, as you have seen here, you know, legislative memoirs, uh, synodal legislation, uh, economic sources, contracts, uh, all all kinds of sources that can uh, that I possibly can use. Uh, yes, uh, this is a typical characteristic, so, and I think it was evident from this. Uh, as you, you saw here all kinds of sources: Jewish memoirs, Jewish legislation, Jewish responses, uh, Pinkasim, uh, Jewish uh, minute books, and uh, non-Jewish sources, uh, church legislation, general legislation, contracts. Um, books of the uh, rural communities and so on and so forth. So you use diverse sources but yes. not all the sources. So it means the statistical, statistical you, can, you can apply statistical methods to... to no, you can, but, but, you might, you can but, but there is a rule. When information repeats itself again and again, you can say it's not uh, unique but a typical phenomenon. Of course, you can give statistics. Well but, uh, yeah, well it's a well-represented case, you know, we know it from different independent sources, and so on and so forth. So, yeah. And also, if, if the, either the church or the rabbis find it necessary to issue regulations, it also means Yes, because we know legislation is never about something uh, unique and uh, uh, one. It is, but usually it isn't. Usually we know that legislation is needed when the, the thing is uh, happening rather you know, extensively. I have a question. Where is the proper figure of Jewish education in this country? Uh, of course, yeah. this uh, even Shlomo Maimon that I have mentioned is not only a, uh, well, he's prominent. He's a non-philosopher. He's uh, very known for his philosophic work, and uh, philosophers studied him till uh, this day. Yes. Uh, so he was a very prominent scholar and educated man. But of course, you are right that uh, uh, enlightenment, uh, enlightenment in general, uh, even in the 18th century it was only the beginning, the very, very beginning of enlightenment in Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, in the Jewish circles, and in Eastern Europe in general, you know, in Poland, the Enlightenment reaches Poland only well, in the 30s or uh, even in the 60s of the 18th century. Uh, so very late, relatively to the West. If this is your question. And of course, most of Jewish society was uh, traditional, we call traditional society. If such a thing exists, yes, so there's maybe some doubts about this. Yes, so. Uh, but what we used to call, what, what we are usually calling traditional society, most of it was traditional society. Yes. This was, I mean. Uh, 
Thank you very much for the presentation. Very interesting. I was sitting and thinking, how many references to your article I have to insert in the first volume on my, <laughs> of my book, The Shtetl as it was, and when I got to number 12, I realized, no, it cannot be true. <laughs> so it's, it's really um, amazing how many um, um, points in common uh, we have. Um, I would not go into that. I, I'd, write to, I, I'd rather say a couple of things about how to improve this paper. Okay, with some so so <laughs> instead of instead of asking you questions, you told me that it's 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 uh, not a ready to go paper. You are planning to improve it. So let me let me share with you uh, some insights. Before I do that, uh, let me take a point uh, that uh, uh, Professor Bartal uh, mentioned about the fascination of Jews with uh, with nobility culture. Um, uh, I would like just to mention that that uh, out of seven chapters of the first volume that I have done, um, I, would, I would say six entail the material just about this question, about the impact of the nobility culture on the everyday Jewish life, including furniture, all this, um, daily rituals, um, and other things, uh, all sorts of practices uh, that reflect uh, what you call the fascination, uh, and one of the one of the typical things that that, that that I found is that when the Russian police apprehends Jewish gangsters in the 1790s, in the 1830s, all of them, without exception, have big fur hats, uh, reminiscent of the of the hats used by Polish nobility. All of them have blue, dark blue or red kaftans with bozument, with brocade, with, 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 with golden embroidery, and, and other things that, uh, that show that once a Jewish gangster gets money, the first thing he does, he, order, he commissions a tailor to, to, to have a good suit that, that would make him really looking like a Polish <laughs> magnate. Ice. Pardon? Ice. Yes, five two chibiks, chibiks. Uh, uh, what called? It's, it's 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 all over the place. It's, it's just it's, it's, it's just just amazing. And and um, I also discussed how uh, the tzaddikim are using all sorts of um, types of furniture in their houses to remind themselves that they are as important as as magnates. And, and the, 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 there are really a number of, of outstanding sources. I, I'm amazed that other scholars uh, uh, miss them. Um, you know, when Rabbi Israel of Ruzhin uh, left Ruzhin and, and went to, to live in Sadiga through Bessarabia, we know for what kind of reasons um, he was simply running away. The local dwellers uh, made good use of each and every item they could apprehend in his house. And two years later, Russian police goes into his house and makes a list of everything that had been stolen. Because the landlady who owned uh, the land on which the house of Israel Ruzhin, in Ruzhin was standing wanted to sell it. And she realized that the local dwellers stole everything they had. So there is a list of stolen things in Rabbi Israel Ruzhin's house. So you put this list and you go, for instance, to Zamost and you make a list of, uh, of items uh, in, in vintage, right, uh, in, in, in the local palace of the magnate, and you put this list together, and there is very difficult to distinguish between them. Okay, so I can go into that, but I would not, because this is, this is about uh, something different that I hope we'll have time to discuss next Wednesday, if... Uh, but Johan, uh, do you know what the magnates were at that time? They didn't wear the thing you were referring to. They were it some time before. As when the Jews uh, wore these fur hats, magnets didn't wear them. No, no, no. They, I'm, they, I'm they not talking about tribal. I'm they, talking they about different things. The, the, these are these are described. They looked exactly as not as uh, East European gentry, but exactly as the lords in the West with this long hair, those uh, how to say aprons, you know, not aprons. No. Well, if you look at it, you see that it's more um, complicated than that. And then you also see that the <coughs> servants the, in the her, uh, lord's house were dressed the same as the girls. You see, you have this the problem of uh, 
fascination, it's not a real contact, it's more um, complicated than that. As I said, we know this phenomenon of degradation. Well, you need a couple of frameworks for that. I, I, I really do not want you to mention it right now. Right. But you probably remember that we have the full description of the property of Rabbi Shlomo Ben Eliyahu of Vilna uh, Palace. You know, from the 90s of the 18th century, where you see that it's a, the same you know, it's a spitting image of, 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 of the Magnus Palace. Right, absolutely. Okay. Okay. So, okay. so that, that's, that's I, 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 I use the same wording. I use uh, the word fascination with the, with the nobility culture. Let me, let me discuss your, your, your uh, uh, very interesting and inspiring piece. Number one, um, you mentioned on a number of occasions that um, this and that practice was widespread. And you say it is because. Um, these laws, these regulations, uh, church or rabbinic regulations, were reenacted, reinforced. From here, we infer that uh, there was such a practice. Instead of repeating it every now and then in the article, I would make a point at the very outset of the article. I would say, you are mostly relying on uh, descriptive archival sources, but also on prescriptive church and rabbinic documents. And the fact that these church and rabbinic documents were reinforced on a number of occasions tells us something about the reality behind them. They prohibited things that were taking place. Right? This is how the prescri prescriptive source works. It prescribes, it, it proscribes something, to use the correct legal word, right? Pro, with, with, with O. So it prohibits something because the practice is there in place. So I suggest saying this at the beginning and then avoid uh, this repetitive uh, reference to widespread practice, number one. That's some just general mythological observation. Two, um, the question is, who do you write for? If you write for the um, general audience and if the article goes into, uh, let's say, um, early modern history journal or, or uh, modern, modern history journal, that's one thing. If you write for the Jewish audience, I do think it's quite important to remind the readers why the church is so rude to the Jews engaged in, in all sorts of uh, prohibited uh, relations with, with Christians, especially sexual relations. And in this particular case, I, 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 found, I, I found it just quite regularly uh, among the Jewish audiences. Jews, excuse me, do not understand why the church is so aggressive. And you have to explain that if a Christian lady converts from Christianity to Judaism, it doesn't mean that she's a bad lady. It doesn't mean that the Jew is, an, is, is, is a nasty uh, human being. It doesn't mean only that they uh, really uh, <coughs> violated a very important of social boundary. It means that the um, sacraments do not work. And that is a blasphemy for the church. It means that sacraments, it means that her baptism, that her confessions, uh, that, that, that her uh, previous wedding, if she ever had, all sorts of sacraments, you know, seven holiest things for any Christian do not work. Right? And that explains to a general audience why the church becomes so maddened about that. Three, I do believe that your description of the relations between, between uh, masters and servants as, as a widespread practice is very well done and is very convincing. But your case studies about sexual relations can be taken only as case studies. If you look at what you presented, your case studies are spread in 200 years. And you have how many? Four, five? No. Well, okay, 15. But we are talking about two-thirds of the world Jewish community residing in East Europe. And you have 15 cases of, 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 of sexual relations. I would say, you know, Jews are, you know, people who, who know the sexual boundary in this particular case. I also deal with this uh, cases, and, and um, the Russian courts were very carefully um, <coughs> monitoring this kind of cases. And I found uh, between the 1790s and the 1850s, which is my period, maximum five cases. She is negligent. 
I would say, to put it in a good context, you should mention that, as Alexander Kulik mentioned, this is, these are not typical cases. These are exceptional cases. They are very interesting. They do show, they do demonstrate another aspect of relation between Christians and Jews. But I would not make it into a big point saying that these are typical things. I do not think so. Uh, last uh, but not least, two more points. You mentioned, um, with me it's always been out, uh, a penultimate point. Uh, you mentioned Shabbos Goy. I do think that quite often in Jewish um, historiography, in the study of Jewish literature, from Shmeruk to uh, you know uh, Adam Teller to you to to Magda Tetter, uh, people do focus on Shabbos Goy uh, as as a social <coughs> phenomenon. I do think it's important to look at Sunday Jews, at those Jews who were asked by local Christians, by local peasants who would abstain from milking their cows on, oh, 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 on Sunday, who, who, would, who would ask a Jew to come in and milk their cow. I don't know if one case like that prior to the 1970s. There are. There are. There are. There are. Up to Sholem Aleichem. Excuse me. Up to Sholem Aleichem. You will even find it in Sholem Aleichem. I'm not saying that there is... That there is yes. I'm, I'm not saying that there is a word combination, a Sunday Jew, but I'm saying there is a social phenomenon of a Sunday Jew that, that has to be brought into yeah. in discussion social to balance. Social phenomenon when you don't know in one case. You tell me that my, I don't know, 50 cases, and you have to remember that the cases of uh, sexual relations that were brought to court was the minority of these relations. The majority of them were, of course, never reached, uh, you know, uh, any... Written uh, evidence and do we have the rule uh, in Chadash Medeoraita? Are, are we not allowed to 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 Chadash? What's going on? You know? Yes, no, yes, this is Chadash. Okay, okay. L last point, real last point, and I'll shut up, which is difficult to believe. Okay. Um, among the sources that you are studying, there is one type of sources that. I haven't heard you uh, using, and I do think that sociolinguistic sources might be of great importance for your study. By sociolinguistic so sources, I mean uh, Yiddish proverbs, Yiddish sayings, uh, Russian and Ukrainian proverbs using Yiddish words. Uh, this is, in many cases, about sexual relations, this is about man relations with his wife, this is about food, this is about many, many different things that would show you, for example, to what extent Jews are using today the names for different types of food that are directly Slavic, that are directly Ukrainian. You have kachke, you have kashe, you have rogalech, you have all these words that are 100% of Ukrainian origin, or 80% or of Belarusian origin. If you use these words to show that these words at certain point came into the English language, you are certainly using the language as, as a time machine that shows, yes, there were the but servants for and for the influence of language, of Slavonic language, of course, there are many such, even uh, I show you Babka, you know, uh, yep. here we have it here, and of course, all, uh, all kinds of, uh, of course, we have uh, lots of, uh, of that in the sources. But it's not the but topic of my lecture, it's an evidence for language. language. Yes. Any language content. But this would be... If a minority leaves... This would be... Right. This would be great support for your claim about servants. Because servants do what? They mainly cook. They do other things, but they cook, right? In rich huge houses. Yeah. And they bring in food. So if you use these names of different types of food, showing that this, these names became part uh, and parcel of the everyday Yiddish usage, you are supporting your claim about the impact, about the contact, about the participation mm -hmm. of Jews and Slavs in this shared cultural milieu. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is it. Thank you, Yohanan. I certainly will take it all in consideration. It's important comments. By the way, uh, in your uh, study of legal uh, non-Jewish uh, judicial sources, um, 
have you occurred on places in which they say specifically that the non-Jew or the Jew <coughs> Jewess uh, spoke another language and they translated it into their language, like we have in the case of Viatedut in on the Jewish side? You, you yes, see what I mean? Yes, there are kind cases of, uh, like that. Citing them in the original language and translating Yes, yes, there are some cases. Can you say like something about that in terms of... Uh, but I don't remember now, you see, where it is, and because I brought some cases here, you know, Jews specifically not speaking Hebrew or the other way around, or uh, the, um, the language, of course, wasn't the language of the source. You know that, yes, sure. you know, sure, for sure. So, a brush so code. A code. Well, yes, but it, it doesn't say. It, it doesn't say. Yes, it said that she testified in in Ruthenian. Yes, but. Uh, but the text is in Polish. But, uh, but the text is is uh, I don't remember if it's in Polish. I don't Latin. remember now. Latin, Polish and Latin. Latin. Okay. Polish, yes. I don't remember yeah. now. And they say Ruthenian. They say what? Uh, how do they call it in Polish? Ruthenian. Yes. <coughs> uh, do you feel there is any difference? Between the Ruski, yes. Ruski, of course, not between Ruski. There is an difference between the association of the Jews and the Russian Orthodox Church and Jews and the Catholic Church in this area. Uh, well, in a, all in all, uh, in structural matters, there and is. Also the you so, yes, uh, and also the union. Yes, uh, uh, there is a similarity between uh, Catholic units and the uh, Orthodox Church in the matter of servants, in the legislation, in uh, economic ties, and so on and so forth, like uh, Jewish debts to, to, to do these churches. Yes, uh, we have, uh, in general, we can say a similarity. In ideological, in polemic literature, in, in such things, also we have, uh, in these areas, we have a uh, very strong uh, Catholic influence. We can we see it. I talked about it in the con uh, the conference, of course. But there are also very important differences. Uh, but in the everyday, here the main thing was uh, the structure, economic and social structure of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, and it influenced everyone, all the churches in it, and the Jews, and this was the major factor, and uh, this is the source of similarity. Blood, blood libel cases in this blood. period. Well, blood libel cases uh, it depends. It's more the differentiation is not in the between churches, but uh, in ages. We most of blood uh, libel cases are from the 18th century. Yes, in this uh, area. And then before that, the uh, church is not in directly involved in the blood libel cases. But in the 18th century, we see more and more a direct involvement of bishops and so on in the blood libel, initiating blood libels. Before that, usually uh, the initiators are burghers and the church, to, uh, in the best cases, involved somehow in the end of the process, at the process. But there is a very good book, well, not very good, but there are two books uh, about uh, blood libels. Uh, the best one, I think, is by Gouldon, Zenon Gouldon and uh, Vyach. And uh, by Hannah Van Grimek also, but... Uh, how did you the book? Reminds me of many years ago. Yes, and of course, there was a wonderful seminar of Professor Barta that I <laughs> studied many years ago in this case. Well, I, I wouldn't describe Gulden's book as to explain uh, the fact that Jews uh, were using the Schlachter's family names. Uh, oh. is it, uh, was it an attempt to the Schlachter, or uh, did it simply mean uh, that uh, these particular Jews belongs to a particular Schlachter family? Both, but you have to remember that family names is a very late yes, phenomenon. Yeah, so you see, in the 18th century, we can't even speak about family names, and uh, this is phenomenal already. Not among the uh, uh, not, not yes, of course, not among Schlachter, but uh, among Jews. We are talking yes. about Jews. Yes, and Jews were among the general population. It's a late, very late phenomenon, generally in Europe, in Eastern Europe, even later than generally. And among the Jews, even later than among the others. And so, so this is, 
but when it came, of course, it's part of this fascination, and also, uh, uh, as you have pointed out, uh, justly as uh, to know to whom the Jew has belonged to, to what region, to what state, and so, yes. But, but this is a phenomenon, I would uh, tell it to Jochen, and also those phenomenon, phenomenon of this fascination, really, uh, large influence on the uh, house and the you know, furniture, dresses and names and so on, it's a later phenomenon of the 19th century. In the 18th century, it's, you see it also, but not to the same extent. Uh, it's, it's different, the situation is different. Yes, by the way, by the way. It's well. Yeah. Uh, it's not mathematically, way. but. <laughs> <laughs> Not only in Poland, or, or what used to be in Poland, uh, but also in Kurdistan, uh, Jews uh, were adopting the feminine names, or whatever, whatever you call it, or the local nobility, uh, uh, meaning that uh, the Jews are the protection of this particular family, uh, and pro pro uh, probably the most uh, famous case is the Barazan. Yes. But no, this is not a formal a formal protection, not in the 19th, not in the 20th century. It's more, more a phenomenon of, uh, of fascination, because we see it also in, uh, in general public, not only Jews to the family names, you have almost every second Polish name with the ending of Ski or Ski, no. you know, yes, and this, and, uh, this is a... Uh, uh, Typical for uh, for noble names, of course. So when Polish burghers uh, took their family names, they also tried to to get something like that, some name similar to uh, to uh, nobility. For the names usually were not taken by somebody. The names usually were given. Given. Centralized. Also. Also. <laughs> yes. It was a later. Uh, if you pay enough, you could choose the name. Of course. Especially yeah. in, the, in the Austria, Austria Hungary. Uh, not only in Australia, yeah, it was a process, a uh, you know, uh, combined process. If you were called Goldberg, it's one thing, if you were called Herring, <laughs> there is a direct <laughs> such name, okay? Yes. It says something. On the mark, Gargan Yes. Yeah. Uh, there may be additional reason, uh, because uh, uh, nobility names are usually the, uh, the pandemical, and Jewish names are very really often the pandemical. Just like also many Western European Jewish names is dead, just being from, which looks like most of it. Right? No, uh, most of it is from a place called uh, Moscopolis. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is Polish yeah. literature. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you uh, this thing of uh, fascination of uh, Hasidic dynasties and all that with the uh, <coughs> nobility. Um, the ambience, furniture. Um, was it typical so much for all the dynasties, or was it typical only for Regener, as we read about it? I can't or, or I'm for, not a let's say, later <laughs> was, yeah, the same time. Frank was the same kind. He also went. No, over. Frank, it's a different story. But the, other, yeah, but the other dynasties, they were not so much, you know, they were not. Good. Regional was an exception. No, regional was not an exception. The, the so-called the so-called Ukrainian uh, Hasidism has had this feature in general, and the regional was a branch of this. Okay, I can I can show you Makarov, how, how many other cases which are not regional. Makarov, Rakhmistrivka, Turisk, Chernobyl, the entire Shashel uh, Chernobyl, uh, they, they were all. Uh, within this realm, uh, within Chernobyl, this uh, I can show you some some influence uh, of, of Polish nobility. But by the way, I have a description also from those Bentham and co um, um, documents I mentioned earlier of uh, a Jewish library in uh, Chernobyl in the 80s of the 18th century, mm. which is more or less like a, a salon of, of um, I don't know Polish noblemen because. How else they could have, you know, a bookcase with less doors, full of books, you know, leather-bounded things like that. 
this was not coming from Germany, for sure. Right, and the moment uh, the Sedaglia Rebbe establishes himself in, in, in Sedaglia or Sedigra, whatever you call it, um, the, the, the entire uh, family of Friedman, which is set in Chortkov, in, in other times in, in Yovo and, and other things, Dibigasaf wrote about it um, mm -hmm. uh, quite nicely. Uh, their courts definitely uh, mimic of course, uh, yeah, they, sure they even speak about it. By the way, uh, one way to learn about it is, uh, you know, reading the uh, Hasidic tales that depict their attitude towards the, um, if you like, that kind of external features of uh, high culture. You know, yesterday I was reading a Hasidic tale. I'll tell you the story. Yesterday I was reading a Hasidic tale. Rishner is before the expulsion in his uh, in his uh, in his palace in 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 in, 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 in Brisbane. and uh, Rabbi Mayor of Chernobyl, one of the eight sons of of Menachem, comes to visit, and Rishner says, "Look, I bought these two great mirrors," and Mary looks at these two mirrors and says, "Look, um, is it because it is?" written down in the book that a man has to see the face of the tzaddik every day <laughs> that you have his mirrors. <laughs> it's a great joke. Yeah. To which Rishner says, these are special mirrors. If you look at these mirrors, you can see your pnimi yud. So, so he's trying, he's, try, he, he, you know, he's always with his shticks, right? Uh, he says, you can, you can see yourself through and through, literally. Uh, and uh, the, his point certainly is that, that he's trying to find a way to negotiate the fact that he has this huge mirrors that, that are reminiscent of, of, of the palace uh, of, of the Schlachtig. And on the other hand, uh, he has to make sure that they have some specific spiritual value, that there, there is a Ruchius and Gashmius. And then he, he makes the point. So it, it is from uh, Sefer uh, Kerem Beit Israel. It's, it's a later collection of stories about religion. By the way, uh, Ascala literature observed, rightly so probably, the fascination of uh, Hasidic tzaddikim with Polish nobility culture. I myself wrote an article on that, on Pins, on the Karolim and Hasidic. Well, in mid it's mid 19th century, but it kind of goes back to early 19th century. Polish, not Russian, specifically. And, and since I don't think that, uh, that everybody wrote your article, could you please remind us uh, what are the sp specific features that you found there in, 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 in among Karim? Uh, how they mimic, how they imitate? Okay, this is a, a based on uh, Yehuda Leib Gordon's um, novel, Acharit Simcha Tuga, where he compares uh, everything actually uh, from the way how the carriage of the tzaddik looks like, and it reminds of, you know, uh, the. Yeah, the model of on what period are you talking about? Mm -hmm. On what period are you? The Polish is keepers are much richer than the Polish now. Magnets is something else. Now you are talking like a late 19th century Polish gentry anti Semite. I'm not joking. <laughs> okay. But it's, you know, it's, it's part of the same Polish Polish Just imitate Shlachta, but what of the Shlachta look like peasants? Yes, uh, exactly. that, that, that's, that's exactly that's my not, guess. Not exactly most, of so. the, no. most of the Shanghai Shlachta that Jews met as a fire magnets and stuff. Of, uh, of uh, no, the Chinese the players. That were at the CS at the same time. Those were the Schlachter members that they met. Uh, the Polish Schlachter was large, it was something like between 10 and 12 percent yeah, of the huge. Huge. Yes, it's huge. And it the biggest is huge. Mm? Yes. The biggest and, and it doesn't have yeah, any yeah. titles, formally titles, because it's part of the, the idea of the Zwota von Schlachetskes. Golden the uh, yes, that they, they didn't have titles <laughs> and so most of them, but of course most of this poor Schlachter was also concentrated in, in the, um, central Poland, in, in western Poland. In the east, 
the more typical, of course, were magnate states, but yeah, not, not no, only, no, but of no, course, no, but no, yes, no, but, but they have clients, and these clients performed all the functions of, uh, and those clients came from the lower and middle shlakta. And those were the, the people that Jews really imitated, I think, and, and met on an everyday basis more than the magnates. Uh, yeah. May I yes. yes. Uh, you're asking a very important question, and I believe uh, anybody who tackles this, this, this problem has to put this 10, 12% first. On paper, explaining that the biggest nobility in Europe, let's say France, uh, England, Spain, would not exceed 3.54%. So 10 to 12% Polish nobility is really Oh, yeah. Beyond beyond any any imagination. Certainly, many of these people would have the title, but wouldn't be landless, as you mentioned. What happens after the partitions of Poland? There are two uh, two processes uh, taking place uh, simultaneously. First, Russian government is trying to confiscate uh, the uh, the, 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 the private Polish towns from the uh, from the nobility. It doesn't work always. It sometimes takes 50 years to, to implement, but there is a process of confiscation of the towns from the built. Russia the towns, uh, towns uh, which, which are the still upper in, nobility and magnates. Right, we're talking about magnates. Right. This is one process. So magnates slowly, sooner or later, would would lose their their, their towns. Right, would would become landless. Another process is that Russia. Um, Required from all the people that call themselves Shlachta, the members of Shlachta, who have to be equated with the members of Russian gentry of different levels, one of the 13 levels of the Temple Table of Ranks, they have to produce documents. If they cannot produce documents and prove that they are members of the Polish gentry, they will be considered urban dwellers. And for these urban dwellers, since most of these people could not produce legal documents, that they belong to Schlecht. They acquired a new status, and this status you will find in Russian legislation throughout the 19th century. They are called Odnodvorci, meaning they have a house, they, 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 they have something that reminds you of, of their you know, previous uh, noble status, but they are like any other urban dweller. So Odnodvorci are those Polish Catholics who live in towns who have no rights, who pretend to be Shlachta, very often uh, Russian legislation refers to them as Shlachta. Because, you know, what would we do with them if they say, you know, I, I am the member of this or that um, uh, noble family. But but they have the legal status of Odnodvorsi, and, and, and these are landless, um, rather poor urban dwellers of Catholic, Polish, nobility, descent, uh, that that are on the same footage, economic footage, with with, with, the, with the local Jews, with the local merchants, with the local innkeepers. I have to remember that there were there were. Just a short remark. We have an add to this uh, the pressure, uh, especially in uh, Ukraine. Uh, the Russian pressure on its diplomacy to convert to into Russian. Right. Right. But especially in the cases when they were uh, unions or former unions, etc. Well, in, in 1838, Nicholas I yeah. uh, outlawed uh, the Union Church in Russia. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a very good book, uh, rather outdated, late 19th century book, on the process, uh, on the relation between unions and, and, uh, and Russian Orthodox Church uh, in, uh, um, in Belarusia. And in, let, let's let's put it this way: in in, in, uh, in the Russian, in the lands of the Russian Empire, and um, it uh, really shows to what extent Russia was trying to uh, reorient those impoverished Union Poles in and and and, and, and uh, streamline them so that they would become uh, Russian Orthodox uh, supporters. That was needed also because of the geopolitical question. Yes, these very or Odnodvorci were the, the main support and the main supply of troops and cavalry uh, for all the Polish rebellions from uh, 1794 through uh, 1831, 1848, uh, up to uh, 1864. 
have to remember that some Shlachta members were of uh, Jewish origin because uh, in, uh, hmm? no, not Frankists, just uh, not uh, also Frankists, but just uh, converts. Because in Lithuania, it was the law that every convert, Jewish convert, would get a, a noble title. Uh, a nobility title. Uh, yes. And a also nobleman. It, a nobleman, yes, and also it happened in Poland, we know for a fact, as well. Not all cases. of them, but... Not all of them, yes, but in Poland, no, because it wasn't the law. By the way, we have a, a bulk of such cases with the Frankish uh, massive conversion. Yes, of course, of course. So it's, it's, how many Frankish was the moment? Well, in Lithuania, well, it's hard to say, it's not very... Goldberg 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 writes about it, yes, but it doesn't give pre precise... No, there's no It's no impossible, yes. In his book, uh, Mumarimbe yeah. Bamlete Polinita. Uh, and all along the 19th century, you know, Polish society was obsessed with this Jewish origin, up to the question of the yes. origin of uh, Mitzkevich and things like that. Of course, of course. It was a major thing in uh, and Polish Japan. culture, culture in the uh, late 19th century. And Chopin. Sorry? And Chopin. Chopin. Chopin and Chopin, 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 of course. Frank Frank By the way, let me just, la, la, just add to it, to the complexity of it, that there were also, especially in uh, Belarus, um, in, uh, until the second half of the 19th century, part of Polish nobility and Polish gentry was Protestant. Have in mind, yes, by the way, yes. those have spe specific yes. relation with Jews. We yes. have some evidence in Haskala literature to the specific relation between Protestant Polish nobility, not yes, Catholic. Yes, because and Jews. Um, almost half of the Polish nobility in the 16th century was Protestant. Yeah, many but I'm talking about 19th century. Yes, yes but uh, they said many of it them survived. Died. It survived. It survived, yes. Right. The writer yes. Kabak, yes. Kabak the writes about also that. Middle, um, the writer Abraham Kabak <coughs> writes about this related specific speculation with Polish Protestant nobility. Yes. Uh, I would add that not only the Jews uh, are curious about uh, the kingdom for uh, Jewish origins, uh, not only uh, Polish nobility. Uh, there is a parallel uh, phenomenon. A phenomenon uh, Millions are looking for uh, millions of Armenians assimilated, uh, presumably assimilated into the Polish nobility. Uh, and there is a long list of uh, poles of uh, Armenian origin uh, uh, beginning from Slovakia. That way, I'm not sure that of course. Servants also in the housing, how they penetrate the nobles and so on. It's a typical drama, I think, in general. What about priesthood? I'm particularly fascinated by this myth, probably literary myth, developed also by Karolin, the rabbi, the priest, that only two intellectuals in the shtetl meeting and discussing yeah. theological problems. Yes. Blame, blame, yes. Yeah, yes. Is, it, is it documented yes. for your period? Yeah. Yeah. The yes. pharmacist also, by the way. So the three of the yes. <laughs> take, take <laughs> the local intelligence, you know. <laughs> this is what I talked about. That this is a literally very famous uh, image, yes, but in reality, well, we don't. Well, we see, you know, these priests uh, sitting yeah, drinking, in the, drinking <laughs> yes, in the inn, but. Uh, yeah. For this, uh, it's interesting because it, it, it can, it can uh, uh, somehow uh, document uh, intellectual context. Yes, of course, I understand. Everyone is looking for that, yeah. but and, 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 alas, wait a second, you have much evidence to that. At least, uh, uh, what's your name, uh, our German colleague? Uh, Yvonne Kleiner. Yvonne Kleiner writes about leaders um, in which religious debate between Jews and non-Jews in 18th century uh, Polish towns took place. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you have a very different there, so how about the artistic of Poland the South is from Cuba? No, no, I'm talking about the big direction, the location of the park, for example. Yes, but we, we, we have we have almost no evidence to that. We Sorry, you heard what you mentioned. I could uh, I, I yes, have this to read the ninth, that. It's the 19th century. <laughs> no, 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 I'm talking about early, early 18th century. Where, early 18th where, century. where? Well, look into her uh, writings. Well, I do. The last I years. Do, I and do, there is a I case, uh, yeah. th there was a, a case early 18th century where Jews and Andrews uh, had kind of a war in, in Shame in an inn 
okay, and it was brought to, to uh, the court. And uh, it was d debated uh, for several years. Yeah. But the quarrel yeah. was about, about uh, as we say in the Yiddish literature, <laughs> Nashbo, Vashbo. No, it's Yiddish. By the way, let, uh, uh, there's not, uh, by the way, this has to do also with popular culture. The things that they, we are talking about things that the only way to find them is in legal documents. <laughs> and of course, all the cases in which Jews were blamed that they were offending Christians religious feelings when, you know, a procession yes, uh, was I going through in Vilnius. You know, we have thousands of things yes, yes, about of it. Course, of course. But this is another matter. It's not a debate, you know, it's something else. The Jews in little mm -hmm. towns, the mistake felt very self-confident and marked the Christians. Which goes, it which goes, also in the which goes of the again to, to and, uh, uh, your comment about uh, language and folklore in general, because in, do you know how many Yiddish uh, saints we have about what Jews think of non-Jewish religious feelings and non-Jewish non religious objects and uh, making fun of Slavic uh, words. Um, in, in my doctorate, you have things which go back to early 19th century, but I'm sure that they were before the 18th century. Yes. Even then. Yes. You, know, you know what's the Jewish response to Christos was Christ? You know Ukrainian? Yes. Russia's yeah, yes. <laughs> which you lie like yes, a dog. Yeah. One example. This is something which you know comes from beneath, yes. and it was there. And of course, you have vice versa. You know, Poles. Of course, and, uh, <laughs> not talking dog. about it. No. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. But, yeah. but this is another phenomenon. Well, if, if someone is expecting uh, intellectual debates between a rabbi uh, and a priest, I think I'm sure that once again make the distinction between Catholic and non-Catholic. The orthodox pop is not the, 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 the difference between a garment yes. and a pop. Exactly. Yes, yes. Exactly. Yes, there's a, there is a distinction because even I have this very funny source that the, the peasants complain about their newly orthodox priest that he is a Protestant, an Aryan in disguise. He just <laughs> pretend to be uh, orthodox. And why so? Because they looked through his window and he s they saw him reading books. And this is <laughs> <laughs> the truth that he couldn't be orthodox. <laughs> 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 and the way the jokes, the Jewish jokes about uh, the Jews and the Christians between uh, a rabbi and a priest. Uh, it's a uh -huh. it's a, it's a, it's a uh -huh. There are many of them. Endless. Yes. So I'll read the test. If you want to explain uh, the fact that Jews uh, were using the Shlachta's family names, uh, is it, uh, was it an attempt to imitate the Shlachta, or uh, did it simply mean uh, that uh, these particular Jews belongs both, but you have to remember that family names is a very late yes, phenomenon. But so you see, in the 